Thank you. Thank you, Rowan. Um, good, after good morning, sorry, good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. It's really lovely to be here. And I'd like to thank uh, Martin and Petra especially for inviting me uh, to be the keynote uh, to this Moodle Moot conference. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, just to give you a little bit of um, background about myself, um, so I have to confess that I'm not a Moodle user, as I think most of you are. So um, I'm on the back foot there. Um, but that, I blame my institution. I'm from the University of Sydney, and we uh, use Blackboard. Uh, <laughs> but I just heard uh, that actually Blackboard's been infiltrated by uh, Moodle people. So maybe uh, Blackboard's going to get a whole lot better. I certainly hope so. So I have a, a little bit of a, um, I wouldn't call it even love hate, but I'm not very fond of Blackboard. So in terms of learning platforms that can actually transform uh, education for students and actually for the teachers as well, I haven't actually had really good experiences, but I'm hoping that you as uh, Moodle users um, have and can maybe share some of that with me as well. Um, so I won't be talking about um, Moodle. Um, in my keynote, so, but I'm hoping to offer you some other kind of perspectives on how to design for human and aesthetic experience that are uh, informed by my mixed practice. And so in terms of my background, um, I'm an educator. I'm, as, uh, I work at the University of Sydney. I've been in um, academia for about uh, 15 years. Uh, I used to work at the University of Technology um, in the engineering and IT faculty. So I do have a technical background. That was my first degree. Uh, and then I got very much more drawn towards um, the humanities, um, the arts and performance, and those kinds of disciplines that actually work directly with subjectivity and with uh, human experience. So in my research and also in my teaching, I'm trying to blend those kinds of approaches. Um, if any of you are from, who's from a technical or engineering um, faculty? Anyone here? So you probably know, well, I'm assuming that um, that the kinds of subjects you teach there are much more around the technical rational model. You may be dealing with social aspects, but maybe less. Often the subjective is, is seen as something to be uh, dis distrusted. And um, I know when I was, all the courses I taught when I was teaching software engineering and things like that didn't, you know, there wasn't a whiff really of human experience in there. If anyone used the I word, uh, you were seen as very suspicious and it was sort of shut down. So there's a lot of abstracting away of the lived experience of what actually you experience in daily life, uh, how you feel, what that kind of trajectory is. And so I'm very interested in how to bring that back into um, the design of technologies um, that actually are impacting um, most of our daily lives as well. Uh, I'm also a dancer and performance artist, so I, have a, I still uh, train um, in a Japanese form of buto, um, and you'll see how that also um, <clears throat> is influencing the kind of work I do. So the kinds of projects I do are across art design and human-computer interaction, and I publish towards all of those fields, so I'm very highly interdisciplinary. I'm also interested in how we can use our bodies for learning, and so that will be part of what I'm talking about today. I'd just like to start the talk, though, by framing um, what I do within this idea of the attention economy, and maybe this is some of the things you've been talking about already at this conference. Um, and this idea that, uh, you know, we are, our computers, our mobile phones, and other kinds of devices are continually vying for our attention. Uh, at, at the one time, they're an amazing technology that allows us to do all kinds of things in all kinds of places and are offering all new opportunities for learning. But they also have a dark side, uh, what I like to call a shadow side, in that there are all these sort of unexpected effects that happen that are probably not so good for our general well-being. Um, and so there's been a lot of work, studies around, um, more around in the psychological realms, looking at how we're really living more in a distraction economy than in an attention economy, and how we need to actually manage that. So as designers um, and educators, we need to think carefully about how we design those, the use of these kinds of um, devices and uh, things that you know, we are blending into a sort of an ecology of learning, and whether it's actually having the kind of effect that we actually want, or is it actually leading to more stress and anxiety. I'm just going to start by, by playing this um, video that's called Attention as a Scarce Resource. It's by um, the artist Michaela Davies, who's also a psychologist, and she uh, investigates questions of agency. Um, and so this particular piece was um, exhibited at the Tin Sheds Gallery uh, at the University of Sydney in 2013. And you'll see it's sort of an extreme version of how our lives are actually choreographed by technology. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so uh, that particular piece, um, so it wasn't your mobile phones prompting you to um, do various things, but uh, electric muscle stimulation technology. So I don't know if anyone's ever tried it, but uh, you, you put these pads on your bodies and they're programmed to make your muscles twitch using tiny electrical signals. Has anyone had a go at this kind of stuff? Maybe when you've been to a, a, a physio or something like that for some that kind of treatment. Um, so it, I had a go of this and it felt horrible. It was like this horrible electric thing going down my arm. But maybe that's because I'm so skinny. I think you have to feel a little bit of flesh and it feels a bit better. But I, so I'm quite amazed about how her performance actually kept a straight face all the way through, as if nothing was happening. Uh, I, I wouldn't, I couldn't have actually endured that. But it's you know very vivid, very visceral. Um, example of maybe where we could be going in the future and but it, this is a kind of critical artistic sort of take on, on these sort of ideas um, and what kind of agency we have in these situations our everyday normal lives and we're just having dinner with our friends um, also uh, to make the point that um, our younger generation are really being born into this destruction economy I don't know if any of you have children or you teach uh, children um, or young adults, and this is this is pretty typical. Even you walk around the streets, everyone's on their mobile devices, and uh, the world is really being mediated through those the whole time. Uh, I was sort of impressed and slightly horrified when my teenage daughter a couple of years ago had said to me, "Oh, mum, you know, she was boasting. Look, I'm so great at multitasking. She had like her, uh, you know, she was doing homework supposedly on her laptop. Um, she was uh, skyping with a friend. She was um, playing some sort of game. She was watching two movies simultaneously. Uh, that was multitasking. So that was, you know, they're really, really good at multitasking this generation. But I have to ask the question: How good are they at actually paying attention? Paying attention." to um, a single task and of actually being present in the moment. So I think we're, we're having these sort of conflicting uh, demands on our attention and our, and our capacity to, to uh, pay attention in different kinds of ways and to be present, be more present uh, to our daily lives and what we're doing, that um, these kinds of technologies that are sort of prodding and nudging and, and um, all that kind of stuff, like how, you know, what, what are they really doing to our ability to uh, pay attention? One of my colleagues, uh, Caitlin De Barini, who I'm collaborating with, is also looking at mindfulness in design and uh, looking at various studies that have um, been uh, noticing, noting the sort of deleterious effects of, of this kind of um, uh, practice that is going on. And so we're also interested in how can you manage the rhythms of interaction and this sort of constant pinging notification. I mean, we can turn them off, but I just installed a couple new apps on, on my phone the other day and they were defaulted to notifications. So all of a sudden, these weird pingings and stuff and noises started coming through. And some of them were quite pleasant, but I was like, what's that? And so you continue like, what, what's that, what's that, what's that? Um, so we have to be very careful about how we actually can design the rhythms of interaction. Um, and just because maybe, you know, if we're the educators wanting our students to do things and we want to sort of remind them or nudge them about stuff, maybe as the, on the other end, as the learner who, who's embedded in their particular, you know, life, life practices, maybe that's not so great. So we've sort of got these two sides that we need to look at in terms of that. 
So the approach that I'm, I'm offering, um, what I'm exploring in, in my research and um, in education is this idea of blending design with somatics. Uh, does anyone know what somatics is? No? Okay, that's not very good for the book that I'm about to write. Maybe that's why the book's needed. <laughs> So I use the term somatics, but it's not a very commonly known word, um, certainly not in Australia. Um, and it, you may know it better as things like uh, mindfulness meditation, yoga, um, maybe even Pilates, Feldenkrais, Alexander Technique, uh, some forms of dance, any kind of, maybe the martial arts, some form of practice or training that actually um, starts to cultivate your ability um, to be more sensitive to sensory stimuli, to use your imagination, um, to, to pay attention in various ways. Um, so can I get a show of hands? Did anyone do yoga or meditation in the room? Okay, cool. Okay, so you'll know what I'm talking about. Anyone dance? I'm sure you all do dance. Okay, <laughs> just being shy. Um, so somatics is defined, there's a whole field of study called somatics and um, Thomas Hanno, who um, um, was based in the United States, um, was very active in that field and he ran a whole journal around it. So in the 1970s he coined the, the term somatics as the experience of the lived body from within. So we're very, um, you know, a lot of the time especially um, uh, we're used to, in our society, used to looking and describing um, what we do from the outside. So we can describe how people walk and move and talk. But um, we're not necessarily that good at uh, describing the experience from the inside. I think some cultures are better than others, or maybe if you're, some disciplines are better than others are actually doing that and have a much more elaborate um, vocabulary um, at hand, uh, the arts and performance in particular. Um, and they make the, the, the um, he also says that knowledge is constructed through experience and requires that it be directed or focused through awareness. So how we pay attention, what we're made aware of in the act of experiencing something is, is a key principle in somatics. So some, some of these ideas may actually resonate with um, how we think about pedagogy and learning and so forth. And in fact, these somatic practices are really in some way dealing with learning or unlearning the kinds of um, habit that we actually have in our um, sensory nervous systems. Um, I'm using somatics as an exemplary practice that allows us to do these sorts of things, to actually cultivate presence. Um, many of these practices like yoga and meditation or the martial arts are using our bodies as um, tools to learn, um, to learn with, uh, looking at how we're relating to our environment, how we're relating to other uh, entities in it, how we deal with forces, um, and other kinds of all kinds of stimuli. So a lot of these practices actually use the technique of slowing down. So we want to break out of the natural attitude of our everyday life, the normal speeds we're operating at. And if we start to slow down, other kinds of information becomes available to us to pay attention to. Um, and in terms of that sort of qualities of attention, um, the fact that uh, you can attend to things in very different ways and they will give you certain kinds of feelings or insights into the phenomena you're interested in. Um, these practices also develop your sensory appreciation. So we are a very visual culture. We're bombarded with a lot of images all the time, a very strong visual language, but often at the um, at the expense of the other senses. So how well do we listen? How, do, how well do we um, feel things? How well do we use our kinesthetic sense of movement as well in the world, as well as taste and smell? Um, so somatics in some ways allows you to sort of pay more attention to these and through various techniques and working communities that are developing these skills, you be begin to build your sensory appreciation. And that gives you a practice of discernment. Um, so discernment is the ability to discriminate between different qualities of something. Um, it's probably easier if I use the example of uh, drinking wine. So I think most of you probably um, would have had a glass of wine. Maybe some of you th consider yourself to be a wine connoisseur. Um, I'm not very good at it. I like just drinking it. But um, if someone suggests to me that maybe this wine smells like um, uh, you know, blueberries or something like that, then that's part of me being aware and paying attention to see, can I discern like the scent of, of blueberries in this wine or not? 
So it's actually this feedback loop that happens between these sort of suggestions of someone more expert in a particular practice to the novice that starts to actually build your ability to discern at finer and finer detail. Um, and then lastly, in terms of, you know, how can we use this kind of, um, these discernment and qualities of attention, um, hopefully in evaluating what is the impact of the things we design, the technologies we use on our lived somatic experience. So how do we actually register these things in our body, in our body-mind, um, using our sensory experience uh, or faculties to actually gauge what is happening and how it affects how we feel and the quality of well-being. So I mentioned the term like wine connoisseur, uh, but my colleague in Canada, Tekla, Tipo, Tekla Shiphorst, who's a pioneer in this field, uh, she has written a paper in, about this term somatic connoisseur. So you can, in the way that you uh, can develop your appreciation of wine, which is more to do with taste and smell, you can also do the same thing with how you use all your bodily senses and become a somatic connoisseur or develop your somatic sensibility, as we say. Sorry about all the text. <laughs> so in terms of somatics and design education, um, especially if you're working in more technical fields, it's probably something quite radical. If you're working in the arts and humanities, maybe it, it seems more familiar. Uh, and I know for things like uh, you know, sense, doing sensory eth ethnographies um, is quite common in those kinds of fields. But I, I've also found just from my experience in teaching in um, universities for the last 15 years that there's quite a distrust of using the body. So um, it's considered as trivial that the, it's, this is a place of higher learning for the mind, but the mind is only in your head. When in fact, if you think about theories of embodied cognition, we're really looking at the whole body, the whole sensory nervous system as being part of um, uh, your mind or how you think. So when you start to, you know, my, my question is, you know, what models of the self are we working with? Um, and how are they implicating what we do when we um, design things and when we educate people as well. Uh, there can be a whole bunch of tacit assumptions about these models um, that are below the surface of awareness that we just bring into uh, the work we do. And so in teaching uh, students to be good designers, I'm also looking at how we can surface those assumptions, what kinds of models are we working with so that we're not just um, unconsciously putting them back into the products and, um, and learning experiences that we're designing as well. So I'm very interested in this holistic approach to the body and mind, that we can use both or as, as an integrated um, entity in um, education and in design as well. And so we actually exercise all the senses in these modes of discovery and reflection that are a critical part of the learning process and also how I work with um, design education. Um, so I'm particularly interested in how we can, how, how can embodied ways of working with movement and awareness be translated or infused into interactive te technology design and use. Um, this is a more of a counterexample. So this is one way you could go where you could look at, well, if you're interested in somatics and design and technology, you could look at a somatic practice and think about, okay, well, we have technology, why don't we put technology into that practice and make it better in some way? So there's quite a lot of these, um, uh, put products out there, whether or not they're actually getting any traction or not, or not I don't know, but this one's called Move, and uh, it might have been on a Kickstarter or something, but they're basically saying that, okay, you have, if you want to improve your yoga practice, you should wear our suit, which has some kind of sensors in it, motion sensors. It also has vibration, um, vibration motors in it, and if you're not doing your posture correctly, then it's going to sort of you know, analyze you and go, Zzz, maybe you need to like, maybe that left hip's like not quite Ah, okay, and then you do a correction and then you're like, oh good. But for anyone that's actually done yoga in the room, what's the objective of yoga? Is it correct posture? Meditation. Meditation? Okay, that's, yep, yeah. okay. So it's more towards the inner experience of what's happening, uh, the state of the mind and body. Um, can we get into some sort of state of flow uh, when we're doing this, this practice? Of course, having a bad posture is not good. It's also about alignment as well. Um, but I think sometimes these kinds of um, innovations are sort of missing the point a bit and just instrumenting the body and trying to sort of monitor it and nudge it without, for me, who has done a lot of yoga as well, I, I sort of look at this and go, why would I want to wear this? Do I want to be in the middle of my practice and have this thing vibrating on me all the time because I'm not doing it right? <laughs> Which could be highly frustrating. Um, 
So I'm interested in working in the op maybe the opposite, sometimes this, but also the opposite direction. So how can you actually take some of the principles or qualities from somatic practices and, and infuse them into how we design things or how we actually approach education? Um, so this brings me to um, this design methodology that I developed when I was doing my um, PhD. And in talking to Petra um, in the lead up to the talk, they seem quite interested in, in this particular methodology. So I'm still working with it. Uh, I finished my PhD, I think it was in 2008. And for me, it, it's a way of um, bringing together these three perspectives. So um, when you're working with interactive technologies or when you're designing them and thinking about uh, how to actually develop these kinds of products. My whole take was that you really need to work with these three different perspectives and integrate them. So we have um, the machine perspective, which is really looking at, okay, in terms of um, what is the machine is a general term for the, the system, and what is it actually seeing through its, whatever you choose to be the sensors that you use, how is it seeing the world through those? And then how does that actually link back to the, the people that are using it in some way? So I was looking at movement-based interaction. So I was very interested in, depending on the kind of sensors you use, whether it's a video camera or some kind of accelerometer, um, how is the computer system basically um, constructing a model of the human or the body through that, which would be a very limited model. And then um, balancing that with, you know, what was the person who might be moving and interacting, what were they actually doing? So that's why we have the observer perspective um, and the first person experiential. So the observer is very much me watching you uh, interacting and looking at you from the outside. And then also putting you within uh, various kinds of um, social, so social or cultural frameworks about how what you're doing or moving actually fits within larger kinds of um, <coughs> social constructs, um, and so for, and then and then. But more importantly, is also to make sure that we have the, the experience of the first person, what they're actually, what's informing how they're moving and why they're moving, and what is their actual experience of that, and being able to. Um, access that particular experience in various ways and make sure it's flowing through in, in your design process, process in some way. So uh, sometimes people say, well, that's just, it's really hard to describe what I'm doing and feeling. Um, and researchers also say that as well, how do we get to this somatic experience? But you can get there, maybe not completely. And so I've been developing various methods and other researchers have and how you can get to this sort of lived experience and try to make sure that it stays alive in the design process. <clears throat> Now, um, an important part of this methodology that I use is this idea of uh, making strange um, or defamiliarization or dehabituation. They're all terms for the same thing. And I'm very big on it in terms of learning because I think that, um, especially with my students, uh, we come into a particular subject together. I usually set them some sort of project to do or learning objectives. But um, before you come up with some sort of design solution, I think it's very good to really mess up like the, the context that you're working in and the materials you're working within. It comes back to this idea of the models that we uh, tacitly assume and put into our, into our products and systems. So if, if for example, if you're working with movement, how can you actually, instead of thinking, well, okay, if I want to interact with a connect, eye toy, you know, connect camera, I should be doing this because that's what it's designed to do. Then all you're going to get is various versions of this um, for your interaction models. So I'm saying, well, why don't we go back to some first principles and actually look at defamiliarizing movement and look at some unusual ways of working with it that can maybe you know, create an interesting sort of soup of ideas and imaginings that we may come up with something more interesting um, for interaction. Um, so making strange, going back to this though, is a, is a tactic that's commonly used in art and design practices, um, also in ethnography, um, for disrupting habitual perceptions. So the way we usually perceive things and our ways of thinking as well. Um, so our, our mind is programmed to recognize patterns and it does it very well. It does it with the sort of minimal amount of information possible. And so we do have a sort of, as, as you would know, that we, you, know, you end up having these habits, these routines and habits of perception that allow you to just do things very easily. Uh, we have learned particular skills. Um, so we're sort of in this, 
interesting space, especially when you're designing things about um, doing things sort of on autopilot and on habit, but then maybe also wanting to undo that as well so that we can actually find new ways of doing things. So I'm very interested in the space and various tactics for doing that. So this idea of learning, uh, unlearning and relearning, and that really talks us to this tension between skill and dehabituation. So uh, we may have learnt to do something very well, maybe I've learnt to um, sit on the chair in a particular way, um, and then I might ask you to actually uh, like unlearn how you sit on that chair. Can you find a different way of sitting on that chair that's really out of the ordinary? Would you like to do that now? Okay. <laughs> I will get you to do some exercises, but maybe not that one. <laughs> and so this kind of... Um, Thinking is uh, really underpins a lot of somatic practices, but one in particular that I've also been um, going to class is with a Feldenkrais uh, awareness from movement lessons. Has anyone here done Feldenkrais? Oh, cool. All right. So um, I think in Australia it's very uncommon, but um, Moshe Feldenkrais uh, was originally from um, Eastern Europe and uh, also um, spent some time. He was also Jewish and. He lived in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, he was an engineer and a physicist and a very, very intelligent man. But he, I think in that period of time, he was actually became very well known. He developed this whole uh, movement learning system after he actually had a long-term injury um, in his knee. And then he made that his life work, basically. So he talks, he was really sort of onto this idea of neuroplasticity before it became, um, you know, sort of proved through um, science. And the idea we could actually reprogram our sensory motor nervous system. Um, and through doing things like um, dehabituating, uh, putting constraints on our movement so we have to move in a, a different way to how we normally do on autopilot. So it's a very fascinating system, um, and this idea that learning takes place through our bodies. But also part of the part of his method is that he asks you to do something, like maybe do a very small movement. It could be just turning your head to the left. Um, but he'll after that series of movements, he'll ask you to rest as well. So the idea is that the brain, our nervous system, actually learning takes place when we're in a rest state. And so that's also another concern in terms of this constant bombardment um, by social, social media and other kinds of technologies, is when do our brains actually rest? Um, it's an interesting challenge, I think, that we have. And especially if you're going to bed, you know, last thing you do at night is check your iPhone or whatever it is, and, and you've got that, you're not actually allowing the, um, the brain to go into that rest state. OK, so I'm going to ask you to do something, not uh, learning how to sit on your chair differently. Um, but if you could just turn your head to the left to look at the person next to you, as they turn to look to the person next to them. <laughs> and just look back to the front again. Um, so what, how did you do that? How did you use your body to do that action? Okay, maybe you know, maybe you don't know, but I'll ask you to do it once more, but now do it at half the speed you did. So which part of your body did you move? <laughs> neck? Okay, great, neck. Anyone else? Eyes? Hmm? Shoulders? Neck and shoulders? Anyone go any further down? Vocal cords when you laugh. Vocal cords when you laugh, okay, in the act cool. Anything else, anyone further down? Back. Hmm? Yeah. Back, legs. Okay, so there's some highly mobile people on this side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> this one's just uh, head turning. Okay, so you might have noticed when you, um, when you slowed down, you could actually pay more attention to what was happening. Um, and how you actually perform that action. And that's really the key of what the Feldenkrais practice is. Um, slowing down, paying attention, being aware of how different parts of your body are organized in that particular act of moving. So what is, there's an awareness through movement lesson or probably several of them that actually would work with that action. But um, 
Moshe would say that the action is actually coming from way down here in, in your pelvis. So he's very interested in the head, head to tail connection, the spine and what's happening all along that um, in terms of recruiting movement. And in fact, so you could actually support that movement better by lifting up, you know, having this upward action from your pelvis as it's grounding into the chair so that your whole spine and rib cage is turning as well. You'll probably find that as you're getting maybe older or if you just look at the computer all day long, you find it harder to do this. So then if you do, and as a person over there actually rotated their pelvis around, you can suddenly look right behind the room, almost 360 degrees. Um, okay. So the key principles in sensing yourself. So I'm really talking here about how we can use our bodies as a platform for learning. And the, in this particular practice, you slow down the movement and you move with awareness. And that's really the heart of these somatic practices that allow you to become more perceptually aware. Um, Moshe uh, Feldenkrais also works with, with this particular principle called the, from psychology called the Weber-Fechner law. And that's most easily explained by saying, OK, if I was holding a heavy brick in this hand and a fly landed on it, would you be able to notice the, fl the weight of the fly on the brick? Probably not, unless you're hyper, hypersensitive. If you're holding a feather on the other hand and a fly lit on that feather, do you think you might be able to feel the weight of the fly? Potentially. So that's, that's the, the principle, basically, in action. And so he took that principle, as he was a physicist, and um, applied it to this domain of movement learning and said, well, what we need to do is reduce the physical demand on the body. So instead of using highly vigorous movement, if we can use very gentle movement and slow down and, and move slowly in small increments, we'll actually be able to notice more. So your perceptual discrimination will improve and actually your control over those movements will improve as well. So you might have noticed that maybe you're walking and you, you've got this thing going on and you can't really control what's happening on that leg. So he'll put you through a whole range of very fine adjustments of sequences that start to work with all the fine muscles in the body and, and in a sense sort of wake up what's happening and reconfigure how the body actually organises to allow you to perform the action with more efficiency um, is his whole thing. Um, interestingly, also in the somatic practices in Feldenkrais, you use your own body or self as a reference, as a measuring stick. So often in the, in the class, you might go to a one-hour class and um, the teacher will ask you to lie down at the beginning on the floor and to scan and just take, pay attention to how your body is sensing the floor and, and what parts are connecting and where you're feeling tight and all that sort of stuff. So you're kind of getting a, you know, you're registering what's going on. And it's a baseline because then when you've done um, done some of the exercises, you then lie down again and you're asked to just kind of sense, what's the change? How do I feel now? And you can feel differences. So maybe things were feeling a bit uneven, maybe they've evened out, maybe you've got a greater sense of flow, maybe your breathing is able to travel right down, feels like to your toes rather than stopping here. Um, and walking as well is used as an iconic movement <coughs> pattern where you can start to see the influences of what you just did in a particular awareness through movement lesson. So I find it a really fascinating practice. And there are a number of researchers um, in human computer interaction that are looking at these practices and how they can be infused into technology design. Um, so not just myself. So another important part of somatic practice is this idea of defamiliarizing perception. And what I just mentioned was some ways of doing it. But I've also been, um, the body weather, the, the performance training practice that I do is, does a lot of this kind of work. And so I asked uh, performance maker Linda Luke in, um, to give a workshop to my students, my Master of Interaction Design students, um, only last week. Uh, we're actually working on out on site. So on the Cadigal Green at the, in the university, and they have to come up with this sort of playful uh, design, ex playful experiences on these different sites. So they really need to be able to read that site um, in a, a fairly deep way, not a superficial way. So I thought it would be great for them to actually go through some defamiliarization um, techniques to get them to look at the world more closely. 
So a lot of people just use, it's a beautiful park area there, but it's on the way to the train station. So a lot of people are just zooming through on their way to their class or on the way to the station. Some people hang out on uh, the green, on the chairs and so forth. And they've just recently put some ping pong tables in. So that's pretty cool. That's good fun. Um, but when we first asked students to sort of map the space and, and, and take notice of the different um, sensory stimuli there, um, you know, there was a level of engagement, but there was a little bit of a, okay, so we've done this and now what sort of thing? You know, what do we, what do we make of this? Um, and how engaged were they? How were, deeply were they able to actually engage with the different sort of senses and describe them? So I thought, okay, Linda can come in and, and do this workshop where we do a lot of stuff with um, defamiliarizing perceptions. So this is the mirror walk. And this one, you have a small mirror and you place it just around here, just below, around your nose. And you're basically looking at the world upside down. <coughs> and you have, we walked, did a very slow walk. We walked around in trails. So you're seeing the world upside down. It really, it's really, it's a very unusual way of looking at, at things. You get to see the undersides of trees, of buildings. Um, and it feels quite sort of cinematic as well. So hopefully in doing that, you're actually bringing people into a very uh, state, state of alertness and you know being highly attentive to what's going on around them obviously because you can't you're not using you can't see the ground either so you really have to pay attention so you don't like fall over um, but you're seeing the world hopefully in a new way we also do this one a little bit later in the day um, I really love this exercise it's the it's um, I call it the collaborative collaborative string in mouth slow walk and uh, <laughs> So the, it's a task. So we thought, OK, um, compared to the previous workshop I've done with students, we said, well, um, go and do a sensory ethnography, um, just you know, observe, describe the different stimuli, such as the visual, the sounds, the temperature, and the sight, and so forth. That was OK. We thought, let's set them these slightly challenging tasks, I actually ask them to really pay attention and, and notice things. And so this one. Um, it's a piece of string that you have to hold in your mouth. And so you're connected to the person next to you. And so the idea is to walk in a straight line. Um, and you could do this with your eyes closed or not. But you have to sense where the person is next to you through the string. So it's a sort of mediated contact to the person next to you. Um, and they were walking down this grassy verge. So we we're also, with that one, also playing a little bit with, like, in terms of interventions in sight, what's it look like when you put a uh, you know, a row of bodies there when they're work, walking at a particular speed and so forth. But for this one, I think the students, it really brought them um, into, uh, I think, the, the heart of the exercise. And they really, you could feel that sort of energy shift in the space, that they were really present. Uh, they were trying to walk with each other and, you know, really there, there in the moment. Um, and I think so. It's interesting. I'm interested to sort of find out how this kind of this kind of um, technique might flow into their design thinking from now on. Okay, um, and a little uh, exercise for you. So which a lot of this is about slowing down, uh, and you might think, oh yeah, I, I know how to walk slowly, but do you? So in the practice, uh, the body with a practice, we do a lot of speed change things, and, and one of the easy things to do is to start just walking. You know, you walk a certain speed, normal pace, and then we, I just asked you like before, to sort of halve the speed and then halve it again. And then it might be again, and we get down to a point where, okay, let me just see if I can do this. Tricky in the shoes. Um, maybe down to one centimeter per second. And then we also do this practice called bisaku, which is slow speed work, but at one millimeter per second. Now that's super challenging. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to walk, but um, what you can do, it's an interesting exercise, is called bisaku hands. And you're going to move your hands very slowly. But if you just put your hands out in front of you so you can see them. And you can do this with your, um, so one hand, just close one hand, open it, close the other one, open it, and then do them opposite directions at the same time. Yeah. So that's the action you're going to perform. Right. So we'll start with it in one position. You can either do it with your eyes closed or open. And we're just going to spend a minute where you're going to move your hands as slowly as possible. 
uh, one closing and the other one opening. Okay? Ready? Go. Okay, that's one minute. Um, anyone like to share anything or chat with your neighbour about what you just experienced or noticed? Oh. Sorry. Did you want to say something? Hey. Did you want to share no, she, she, we're talking about your hands. <laughs> All right, so that, that was an example of slow speed. And in the body weather practice, we do, and do total body, like whole speed like that as well. But you often get to these sort of crisis points in the movement, you know, when you're suddenly down here and, oh my God, I'm moving at one millimeter per second. You can't actually do it. But it's very interesting in taking you to sort of those edges of um, sort of the impossible as well. Um, okay, I just noticed I'm probably running out of time a little bit. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about this, this project which is around the aesthetics of slow walking that I'm doing in collaboration with Frank Feltham from RMIT. He's um, actually doing a PhD with me. He's an industrial designer and um, musician and has been developing these sound responsive surfaces. Um, they have pressure sensors in them, which is not like a new thing, but what he's looking at is actually the, the quality of the sound and, and how it connects back to a, a somatic experience in the body. So we've been doing studies with some dancers, with our Bhutto dancers, and also with Feldenkrais practitioners to try and understand what's going on in that act of walking and how we can use sound, this sort of responsive sound, to actually slow people down and open up different kinds of um, kinesthetic experiences. And so it's very interesting in uh, that the two studies with um, like the Feldenkrais practitioners were very much um, uh, very committed to their practice and their way of walking. And the sound was providing them information. So part of the information maybe about an unevenness in their gait um, and things like that. But they weren't so, they couldn't see how this kind of surface could connect to their practice in any way. It was like, well, okay, we tried that, but uh, okay leave it over there, um, which I'm, I'm surprised at because Moshe Feldenkrais, I'm sure, it was very much about how we, how we use our bodies in everyday living and the environment where we are coupled to all kinds of objects and structures and, and systems, um, be they physical or um, virtual as well. So um, that was unfortunate, so it didn't really go anywhere. But the Bhutto dancers, on the other hand, um, and maybe also because they do use slow walking in their practice and work with these ideas of imaginative worlds, um, we had a much broader range of responses around what happened and around how the sound evoked different kinds of um, images and qualities that actually um, supported their moving in new ways, like in unexpected ways, which is what we're interested in. Um, so just back in terms of uh, the 
my methodology in terms of those three perspectives, the machine, the observer, and the first person experience. So that's what we're really applying in this study. As you can see, one of the dancers here walking very slowly, um, so you can't hear the sound. But we're doing a range of different um, observational techniques um, and, and analysis in terms of understanding what's going on with that walking pattern. Um, this is more from a kind of like a gait analysis um, and how you use your foot in contact with the floor. And then also applying things like Laban movement analysis, um, which uh, is a system that has, uh, it's a very highly developed system for uh, describing different facets of movement. Um, also in terms of the kind of uh, how you use weight, how you relate to space. Uh, and the idea of flow in movement and also how you relate to time. So different kinds of, this would be like the observer perspective, looking at the body from the outside and putting it within different sort of systems. Um, <clears throat> and then also, of course, the, the first person movers perspective. So um, in this particular study, we're asking the dancers to describe what was happening while they were working on the surface. Also, what was, uh, how were they responding to the sound, the different kinds of sound options we gave them, and uh, what kind of kinesthetic uh, experience was happening. How were they aware? How did the use of sound actually shift how they normally uh, relate to their body in walking? So we're trying to get into that kind of digging into that terrain so we could feed that back into how we designed the interactive sound components. And so at the moment, Frank's really looking at this idea of these sort of um, ease in, ease out envelopes and also playing with um, one, we did another study together um, more for a performance uh, down at RMIT, part of Performing Mobilities Conference. Sorry, this is me, I like dressing up. Um, um, this is the Interstellar Movementicians. A little bit of a sort of Star Trek nod there to uh, Spock. And so we thought we'd actually do a performance on these uh, pressure plate surfaces and really look at how we uh, work with shifting of balance, very slow movements. Um, and this idea of sort of going off balance as a creative act as well. So uh, we worked together on this particular one. Just so you can get an idea, it doesn't look very exciting, I know. <laughs> but uh, there was more to the performance than this. But just so you can hear, there's uh, a number of different sounds, some sort of gurgling, uh, bubbling uh, creaks to uh, the sound of wind, and then these more sort of sci-fi sounds that come in later. Um, so we were looking at how to design for this kind of interaction. Very slow movement, subtle shifts, and and then I recorded this bit here as me explaining how I was working with the foot in contact with that surface. So we know our hands as, as highly, highly agile um, instruments, sources of embodied knowing, but the feet can also be viewed in that way. How I relate to my foot, and instead of just thinking of it as like I said, one one unit that I place on the floor which I think we normally do in walking, it's just a yeah. very utilitarian thing. I actually think about it with many degrees of freedom, so there's all the different bones and feet that you can articulate, and yeah. uh, which part of the foot I'm placing onto the platform. Yeah. And that point of contact, which is what we were playing with in the performance, is the first point of contact, because you can just whack the foot down and get an instant sound. So, mm -hmm. Get a deep response, yeah, yeah, yeah. or I can place the foot very lightly on the surface. There's no sound, but as I start to pour my weight into yeah. my leg and down into my foot, I'm thinking about which points, which part of the foot is making the most contact with the. So, okay, finally, I notice that as I start to move my weight right over the top of my right leg, I've got maximum pressure. Yeah down into the floor surface and hopefully the sound is yeah. coming up but of course I need to probably move my foot to the edge of the thing about my response. And then I can I can sort of ease ease off. So I've got that whole surface of my foot that has now got many possibilities to control or influence the sound. But the rest of my body has to support as well. So um it is playing kind of all that. Okay, um, 
so in that particular system too, one of the things we're doing, a lot of these, you know, especially when they're in a kind of public space context, you know, you get people just jumping on them and it's a very immediate, I get, I get some sort of feedback going on. But we're trying to look into more of the nuances of that kind of what's happening in that response and how um, you could actually have an evolving uh, response or behaviour in the sound emerge. So that if you sort of uh, lingered there or put more pressure on in a very slow way, you'd start to get different kind of sound effects coming up. Um, so that's something, kind of getting a, rewar a reward for actually slowing down and paying attention. That was sort of part of the thinking in that particular um, project. A similar thing's actually going on in another project I'm doing at the moment called Dyad Dance Study, where we're looking at, um, again, you, this tension between sort of immediate feedback and understanding how the system is working interactively to then having this sort of more surprise or unex you know an evolving behavior of the system uh, that will actually promote curiosity so that um, you know you don't get bored after going oh I move it it does this I get a sound response so these are the distributed interactive audio devices that um, I'm collaborating with Oli Baun um, from UNSW Art and Design and Sam Ferguson from UTS, they're actually building these, this system and also working with another dancer, Kirsten Packham. So we're looking at these more sort of improvisatory tools um, and so we're doing a number of sessions looking at how to actually work with different, some of the different sound parameters. It's an interesting system because uh, Oli's a creative coder so he's got it, it's all wireless, it has motion sensor in it um, and a bass burger and a speaker actually built in so the whole thing's like a unit you take around. Um, but from the main computer, he can actually program things on the fly. He can download different code, uh, tweak the parameters and so forth. So you could actually do a live performance where he was changing things as they go, or we can just have it and sort of set the system. Um, but within those two, there's this sort of evolving behavior. The, the interesting thing we're finding in this study uh, is that what the sound guys think is really cool the dancers are not like so like excited about. So it's it's interesting getting this, you know, these different disciplines where they're like, oh, really cool sound and, and, and you know kind of like the insides of the codes, you sort of know it's doing this really cool thing. But as a dancer listening to it and having movement possibilities with it, we're like, that thing is really annoying, we don't want to hear that anymore kind of stuff. Um, you know, can we do something more subtle? Can we do something more, you know, yummy in the sound? So um, it's an interesting process we're still working on at the moment. Uh, hoping to move towards some kind of improvised performance. Um, but we've got to get like the, the sound quality, we've got to get that sorted because uh, these sorts of devices uh, have a tendency to get quite annoying quite quickly because uh, the sound can be quite repetitive. Um, okay, I think I might, um, so for that one though, okay, in terms of actually this going back to the first person experience and trying to document um, how the dancers you know, what did I just do? I just spent 10 minutes improvising with this device, moving around, um, using on different parts of my body, listening to the sound, but what, what just happened? So we found that um, if we left it too long, that we, we, we were being really good to start with and had this very um, you know, structured, like, okay, we'll do half an hour and then there's a questionnaire you fill out and all this sort of stuff. And then we did one session where we um, ran out of time and so we, it was all being video uh, recorded. Well, look, we'll just come back you know, a couple of days time, look at the video, and we'll be able to describe what our experience was. So um, video cued recall is a technique we sort of, I've used before on stuff. But for this one, it just, it had gone. We just, you know, we couldn't really remember all the, the, the interesting details about what was motivating that movement and how it felt and what the sound was doing. So that was a little bit of a, oops, um, okay, we, what we really need to do is this, our preferred method is we might, um, explore for say 10 minutes or half an hour and then we immediately do stream of consciousness writing. So we don't go into the evaluative headspace, we don't get analytic, we just dump what we're immediately thinking about and experiencing and that can be you know, it won't be neatly written in terms of good grammar and all that sort of stuff, but it's just getting out immediate sensations, the impressions, your imaginings, the strategies we're using to, uh, in that sort of interactive sound movement nexus and any points of interest. Then we talk and share. Then if there's a, a group of us or the uh, uh, dancers, we'll actually share what we just experienced. We may re-perform and talk aloud. So it might be, you might grab that ball again and go, oh, okay, I was doing this with it, this is what's happening. So it's immediately like a reenactment or embodied co-discovery where we try and the other dancer then tries and mimics what the other person's doing to figure out what was going on. Um, 
After all that, then we actually do some more structured analytic evaluation. So I've got this questionnaire where we're trying to figure out, um, you know, what are the uh, different trade-offs in, in this kind of thing. Um, so that's that order is important. Uh, if you're trying to work with lived experience, immediate experience, you can't get analytic too quickly because it, it sort of destroys the experience or the immediate quality. So I would recommend something more like this, more from a sort of stream of consciousness writing um, is probably going to be more effective. Um, I think I'm going to leave it there. Uh, just to end and say that um, one of, the, one of the takeaways here is that um, by doing these kinds of somatic trainings, we can actually become more perceptive and aware in this world in which we act. And so uh, you may think, OK, those kinds of practices are sort of over there somewhere. But if you bring them into uh, uh, design and education, they can actually have a very um, efficacious impact on your sensing and perception and your imagination as well. So just to end, um, I'm writing a book with Tekla Shipost, and it's around this idea of um, experience as skill, the fact that we have experiences, but we can also, through these kinds of practices, develop experiential acuity. And that's going back to some of the things I mentioned before, that we actually can train our observational skills, um, our, how we discern uh, the world, um, our focus, and how we can actually synthesize those various perspectives across first person, observer and machine, and also be more, um, cultivate some sort of empathic relationship with the world around us. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? <laughs> Would anyone like to ask a question? Oh, yes? Uh, just more of a <coughs> Thank you very much. I was, I was really enjoying that. Um, I see some parallels with the slow dancing you're describing um, and how we interact with machines and interfaces and the sort of things we're designing uh, in, in education that the, um, if we really slow down and look at our interactions with the technologies that way that we can mm -hmm. really uh, make those technologies perform better in the dance with us, basically. So I was reflecting on that. I just oh, wanted okay. to share that with you. So I found that yeah. very useful. Thank you. Yeah, uh, another way I think of, yeah, this kind of maybe slow choreography of um, interaction with devices. I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting tension because we obviously we like things to happen really quickly as well. We like to get fast reaction times. And so forth. So we, you know, we don't want sort of slow internet, but we do. Yeah. How do you create spaciousness, spaciousness within that kind of flow of interactions? An interesting question. So, yeah. Thank you. Right. Yes. But just behind. Um, you talked earlier about uh, questioning the tacit assumptions that we make mm -hmm. uh, when we consider the, the model of our body or the model of our design. How do you do that? Because if you think about, and I'm trying to think about like, what are the tacit assumptions I'm making in my design? And I can't get past the fact that I've already assumed them. I don't know what they are. So what, what's, what's some ways we can actually do that, figure out what are the assumptions we're making? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I'm just trying to think of an example. Um, yeah, it's interesting. As, as an educator, you know, I, I set these projects for students in assessment, ask them to do various things, but um, they may not, you know, students don't always react in the way that you expect as well. But I think um, sometimes that happens better in conversation. So when I was running a design studio last year, on we, I set the topic on healthy workplaces. So it was looking at body-based interactions, wearable technology and um, this idea of the healthy workplace and how we could actually encourage people to be more active and so forth. So I was lucky to have quite a small number of students, like only about you know, less than 20 students in the class. 
And so we did um, a variety of things, like because it was all about trying to disrupt the workplace and how we sit and various things like that. I changed the classroom so that um, you know we had a variety of things to sit on. You could sit on the floor, on a cushion, um, you know, on a normal chair and all that sort of stuff. And I, so we went around and talked about our different kinds of practices and you know how we how we use our bodies at work, how we use them at home, and things like that. And just try to have a conversation, because a lot of students also from mix, uh, different you know, international students as well, so there's a whole range of cultures already in the classroom. So I think um, having some sort of you know, way of structuring or scaffolding that discussion, um, asking people to actually like, do enact things, so you can actually see what people do, and then we can uh, critique and um, and sort of bring to the surface that sort of stuff. So even something as simple as walking, we think is, or we, you know, everyone walks the same. But if you look closely at different groups of people or different cultures, we know that there are different kinds of um, maybe philosophies informing uh, how you use the body in walking as well. So a lot of Asian cultures, it's a more weighted approach to the ground. Uh, they might also, probably not now in a modernised world, but previously there was a lot more squatting went on too. So those kinds of ways of thinking. In our, in our Western world, we tend to equate squatting with something dirty and you know, inappropriate and indiscreet. Um, but it's actually very good for your actually, you know, pelvic system. Um, and so even those kinds of practices, just trying to get, you know, have these discussions about things or try things out that um, you may get unexpected responses from as well. I don't know if I've really answered your question, but um, yeah, it's it's not a it's not a one-off thing. So it's it's having a number of different techniques to get people to start to try to surface some of that stuff. So, for example, I'm seeing a lot of um, a lot of these sort of posture correction um, innovations out there. You know, you can wear this little th little device. It's going to basically look when you're slouching, and then supposedly you're meant to correct your posture. But what is correct posture? So that's again where I'd be saying, what is your assumption about correct posture? Um, how do we use the body to sit up? In the Feldenkrais work, um, actually, posture's not static. So it's a dynamic thing. So then if you're designing for a static posture, it's very different than if you're designing for this idea the body should always be, you know, or can move, or should be moving a lot. So you'd come up with different kinds of solutions. So it's even just, you know, those sorts of models that we take for granted. We all think we know what correct posture is, but maybe, Maybe there are other better ways to think about it, or other ways. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Tom? Uh, you mentioned something about um, model selves. Can you talk more about mm -hmm. the, the model selves? Models, models of self. That's right. I think that's what that, yeah, my example just then with the posture was getting at, this sort of the model of the self um, that is usually a cultural, a cultural model, yep. um, and but even within within a culture, there may be other alternatives that are um, that we might want to actually think about and design for. Um, and even the model of the self, going back to the idea of embodied cognition, or um, you know, alternatives that where we're just thinking of, of the mind or cognition and learning happening here. But if you want to involve the total body, then you're going to get different kinds of um, you know, you're going to go down a different sort of direction. Uh, I think maybe in the learning realm, I mean, especially in learning where we've moved from an individual or the transmission model to then social constructivism and, and things like that as well. So as long as it's, I think there's a questioning there and an agreement that we're working with a certain kind of model, sometimes that discussion doesn't happen and then you, everyone's falling back on their, on their like tacit assumptions, which may not be the same or healthy or, uh, yeah, so it's, it's good to just surface them in some way. Um, or to read other kinds of philosophies where you find new ways of thinking about things. So um, I guess I'm heavily um, influenced by Eastern philosophies, which very much um, have the mind-body as an integrated system. And a lot of their practices, uh, you know, you have to um, cultivate the body to actually um, uh, in, in change the mind as well. So they're not like a separate thing. Whereas in, in Western society, we tend to have exercise for one thing, and then we go and do our, um, our learning you know, with our mind somewhere else. So I'm interested in those kinds of practices and theories that actually like blend the two as well.
Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I so loved your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, you didn't use the word spirituality, but you've just touched on it now. And I've, sorry, I'm going to read what I've, I've formulated a question while you're talking. So um, I, I guess I work in, in the area of spirituality. Theology is what uh, my institution has been teaching for over 100 years. Mm -hmm. And um, we use the language of discernment, of um, I and the other, the soul, embodiment, models of self, forming the whole self, that, that kind of thing, right? Mm. But then we retreat into these models, um, and like you've said, test, you know, those tacit assumptions, those models of mm. um, delivery and educational design and assessment that is systematic, disembodied, sanitized, boundaried, and we, we kind of cover over diversity. You know, it's, it's not a good situation often. Mm. So um, that causes exploration in the classroom to tend to be theoretical as opposed to kind of lived and experience, so everything you've just kind of been talking about. Um, and I love the, the ideas of making strange and off balance, but there's a perceived risk in that for teachers. Um, can you imagine how technology and your, uh, your research could help this more traditional field of arts and humanities? Where well, we have the language, you know, we, we're thinking, but we, it, it's so theoretical, mm. it's, not, it's not in here, and yet, in a sense, that's our job in the world is, is to do that. Um, and our images and our art kind of express that. Um, how, would, how would your research help us kind of shed that straight jacket and um, yeah, emerge from it? Yeah, it, that's a, it's, it's still a very um, challenging area. I love the question. Thank you and your comments. Um, and, I, and it does call into question, like, what do we think our role as educators are? So I don't think I, you know, I. Um, sometimes it's easy to fall back into that mode of, okay, I've got to teach students, here's this bit of, I'm teaching them about, uh, uh, you know, interface design, okay, here's all the content, I've got to get it out. It's easy to fall back into that. I think that's, and you have to have that sort of in place, but then how do you then, um, you know, design a whole learning experience that can stray into some of these other realms? Um, I think that's why I've been bringing in, for example, the uh, Linda Lute, the performance maker, bringing in people that can do workshops that are working. Well, I, I make the connection between um, that kind of practice or, or defamiliarization practice and how it links into the actual subject we're dealing with. But it gives students an embodied experience that could be quite unusual to what they're normally um, you know, dealing with. But I need to sort of make the links or provide some sort of you know, intellectual scaffold around that. Um, and it's also about giving permission. I think it's very much, you know, this is, it's okay, we're doing this now. Uh, this may not be what you expect to do when you come to university, but um, uh, if you put it in a certain kind of framework, um, I mean, I do like challenging students and um, I think not just mentally, but also if you actually have a em fully embodied experience of something, you're going to, that's gonna really resound with you in some way and give you some kind of um, like felt material to actually, reflect on it and work back in. Um, that's mainly what I, I'm trying to do at the moment, is infuse the learning um, uh, trajectory with these kinds of embodied experiences, but show how they're giving us some kind of embodied um, insight into things that may be um, philosophy or maybe design theories or design methods, things like that, so thank you. I think I'm done. So thank you again. Thank you, Moodle Moot, for uh, um, having me to speak. I will stick around a little bit in the um, tea break if anyone wants to um, talk a little bit further. And I hope you have a really wonderful conference. Thank you.